I work with the Millennium Project that began 15 years ago as the futurist part of the United Nations. And in the last three years, I have also been working at Singularity University that I want to tell you more about later. The Millennium Project, we have offices all around the world, including here in Brazil. And we publish every year a report about the future of humanity. And uh, uh, this year, actually, we talk about Latin America in the year 2030 and how things are going to be in the year 2030. Okay, uh, three years ago, a university was created with Google and NASA, and now we have many other sponsors to prepare humanity for what is going to come in the next 20 to 30 years. And uh, one of those things, obviously, is energy. The, the big energy source in the planet, obviously, is uh, solar power. If you look at the amount of solar power we receive, in one hour of solar power, we receive energy for about uh, one whole year. One hour of solar energy for one year. Then we have other sources like wind energy and so on. Uh, but there are problems like global warming. Global warming, as you know, is real. Global warming is happening. Okay, so we have to consider one of the big issues is not only energy, but also the environment. Energy is changing in different waves, and each wave is cleaner, and it has less carbon, which is the bad part, the carbon. So we are going through a decarbonization of energy and the creation also of an energy internet. This was a concept that was um, invented almost 40 years ago and now uh, actually has received that name, the internet, energy internet. And this will connect the whole planet and we will move from dirty energy into clean energy with the whole planet connected through this energy internet. Uh, besides that, also, we are moving into biofuels, bioenergy, and Brazil is a power in the world in terms of biofuels, okay? And uh, there is a scientist called Craig Venter, who is also one of our faculty at Singularity University, and he's working on artificial bacteria that will produce biofuels. Um, so this is one of the new innovations in energy coming up. Energy also, in terms of uh, solar power, it's becoming uh, increasing exponentially, and the cost is decreasing exponentially. In the next two years, we are going to reach what is called grid parity. Grid parity, when solar energy is going to become cheaper than fossil fuel energy. And at that time, the whole planet will move into solar energy. Uh, if we needed to power humanity with solar energy, we basically only need six blocks in some of the deserts of the planet. These six blocks, each one of 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, that would produce enough electricity for civilization today. So it actually, it's not so much land that we need. In uh, Europe, together with North Africa, they are working on a project called Desert Tech. Desert Tech, in the next 20 to 30 years, they want to produce all the energy that Europe needs from North Africa. And this is just beginning, it's in negotiations, but this will be fantastic. It will be like a Saudi Arabia of solar energy for Europe. And the same could happen here in, in, in the Americas with Brazil, the new Saudi Arabia of solar power for, for the Americas. And we are going to have all kinds of solar powered animals like this solar donkey and also a solar camel, okay? There we have a solar camel. We will power humanity, every part of the world, including Africa, uh, that is the dark continent so far, with electricity in the next 20 years, because we are going to have this internet, energy internet connecting the whole planet, and energy eventually will be free. Energy is going to be like the internet, that basically it's going to be everywhere free. Um, NASA has a plan for the year 2020 about a space-based solar power. And this would work with this kind of solar satellites orbiting planet Earth. And then this energy will be beamed through microwaves to planet Earth. The Japanese are working on something similar. And by the year 2030, they want to begin powering Tokyo with this electricity coming from outer space where the sun never sets. The sun never sets in outer space. So this is continuous energy source all the time. And we need this energy because also we will begin finally 
exploring space. We are going to leave our tiny planet in the next 10 to 20 years to begin with finally moon colonies and Mars colonies. And for that, we need a lot of energy. Uh, this is uh, a very complicated uh, scale, which is called the Kardashev energy scale. Kardashev was a, is a Russian scientist, an astrophysicist, who computed the amount of energy in the universe. And he talked about three different types of civilization. Civilization type one is a civilization that uses all the energy available to its planet. In our case, planet Earth, we receive 170 terawatts uh, of um, solar energy continuously from the sun. That could make us civilization type one. But we are very far from being civilization type one. And then there could be civilization type two when we use the solar power in the solar system. And civilization type three, a civilization that uses all the solar energy in a galaxy. And eventually, a civilization type five which would be all the energy available to the universe. And that is a big, big number. If you look at the bottom here, it's one times 10 to the 46 watts of power is available in the universe. So we are babies still in terms of energy. We are babies. We are not even close to be civilization type one. To give you an order of magnitude of how, mo how much energy and power we have, a human body produces and consumes about 100 watts. We are 100 watt machines, and our brain actually requires 30 watts. The brain is the most energy intensive organ of the body, 30 watts. So we could talk a lot about energy, but I, I invite you to watch Discovery Channel Latin America. There is a series which is called Latin America 2111. Uh, and I was the advisor for the energy program. So I hope that you can watch this in Discovery Channel Latin America. But I want to talk more about the future and what is going to happen besides energy. And for that, uh, I like Mafalda, the most famous Argentinian philosopher. <laughs> and you know, when people ask Mafalda, what is the future? And she says, well, the future is no longer what it used to be. So Mafalda is a very famous philosopher, and futurists, we talk about four ways of looking at the future, four ways. First, the passive attitude, like an ostrich that hides its head and doesn't want to see what is going to happen. The worst possible type of futurist, you don't want to know what is going to happen. Second is to be reactive. When you prepare for something, you respond like a firefighter. The, the third type is preactive when you want to really prepare for something happening. But the fourth and best type of futurist is to be proactive. Proactive, so that you can build the future. You can construct the future you want to be in. So I hope that there are no ostriches here. But if there are ostriches, I hope that you are technological ostriches. Okay? Using technology to change the world. Uh, three years ago, Singularity University was created with the initial support of NASA and Google. This university is located in Silicon Valley in California. We have had students from all over the planet. In this room, we have four of our students. Four of our students are here in this room, and I talked to you before. So we want to have more Brazilians. We want to have more people from all over the world because our mission is to use technology to change the world for the better. And the idea of the singularity might not be known to all of you. Uh, please raise your hand if you know what the singularity is. Have you heard about the technological singularity? This idea was popularized by one uh, MIT engineer called Ray Kurzweil. He wrote this book, The Singularity is Near, in 2005. And this has been the most widely sold book in Amazon.com in science and technology. And he talks about the singularity as the time when technology changes so fast that humans cannot keep track with the technology unless we enhance ourselves, unless we modify ourselves with the technology itself. There is another shorter definition of the singularity, which is the time, the moment, when artificial intelligence reaches human intelligence levels. 
And that is the last invention that humans will ever make. Because after having intelligence superior to human intelligence, there is nothing that we can do unless we enhance ourselves with technology. Now, how can you know that if this is going to happen? If you look at the trends, which is uh, Moore's law, Gordon Moore was the founder of Intel, co-founder of Intel, and he discovered that every two years, computers double their power and they become cheaper. And this trend continues, continues. This is a logarithmic scale. Let me show you what has happened in the last 30 years. 30 years ago, we used the IBM punch cards. This has 1K of memory, 1K. This was an electromechanic uh, memory. And these were invented later. The floppy disk of eight inches. Also, this has 1K. But this 1K was better because this is um, electromagnetic and this is mechanical. And this one you could erase and you could write again on. So this is better. But we had 1K and 1K. So 30 years ago, we had, in Spanish, I say, um K y um K, it gives uma caca, uma caquinha, una caquinha de memoria, 30 years ago. Then we moved from this to different, more advanced memories. You all knew this, probably, and also this. If you come to Korea and Japan, where I also uh, teach, they are producing these new types of memories uh, that are like legal pieces that you can add on to them. This is 128 gigabytes. 128 gigabytes. So look, we have gone from uma caquinha to 128 gigabytes. Well, you will remember me in 20 years, and you will remember the caquinha, but this will be the caquinha in 20 years, this. In 20 years, we are going to have computers more powerful than the human brain. And that is computers that have more transistors that um, the human brain has neurons. Um, so let me keep on talking about that. Uh, Time magazine just published recently an article about the singularity. One of the consequences of the singularity is that we will reach physical immortality in two ways, on the human hardware and the human software. So let me tell you about that. Uh, a few years ago, I went to visit Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who was one of the most famous futurist and science fiction writers, and he wrote half a century ago, the three laws of the future. Law number one, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. But when he says it is impossible, he is very probably wrong. Second law, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And the third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. This has a corollary. If you see something that does not look like magic, it's because it is not advanced. 30 years ago, we had no personal computers. 20 years ago, mobile phones were beginning. 10 years ago, Google was growing. What will happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years? magical things. We are going to see magic technologies. We are going to have immortal cells. We will control the aging process. We will have free energy, like free internet. We will have free energy. We will have space elevators. One of our professors at Singularity University, he's working on aging. And he says that aging is a disease, but it is a curable disease. We will cure aging in the next 20 to 30 years. Today, he created this prize, which is the Methuselah Mouse Prize, to have mouse that are going to live 1,000 years like Methuselah. And today, we have mouse that live three times their expected lifetime, three times today. In the next 10 years, probably we will have one mouse that lives the equivalent of 1,000 human years. This is happening now. And with other species, we even have longer uh, lifespans. 
The National Science Foundation talks about the four technologies of the future, nano, bio, info, cogno. Nanotechnology studies the atoms. Biotechnology, the living cells. Nano and bio are the hardware of life, the hardware of life. And info and cogno are the software of life, the software of life. Info studies the bits and cogno studies the neurons. So we have the hardware of life and the software of life. And everything is becoming mixed with virtual reality. Not just real reality, but virtual reality. Uh, this is my human genome. All of you will have sequenced your human genome in the next 10 years, and you will know which diseases you will have in the future. But the important thing is not to know which diseases you will have, but how to cure them, how to cure the diseases, how to prevent the diseases. You will know where your family comes from. This is my paternal line 500 years ago. My maternal line also 500 years ago. You can reconstruct your family tree, and you can construct the descendants, the children you want. You will choose the genes you want for the future and create your own descendants. And this is actually very cheap. People think this is expensive. It was expensive at the beginning. The first human genome cost $1 billion to do. Now, in, in, a, in a few years, it's going to cost about $10 and it will be done in one hour. So this is the complexity of the hardware of the human body, which is three gigabytes. The human body is three gigabytes. I showed you the pen drive before that has 128 gigabytes. How many humans can I fit here? I can fit here 42 Brazilians and one Argentinian. Uh, and then we will have also the complexity of the software, which is the brain. What is the complexity? And the complexity, basically, in Japan, they are working on creating artificial brains in the year 2018. And what is a brain? A brain basically is a machine that computes 10 to the 17 operations per second. And this we will reach in the next 10 to 15 years. We will have machines with the computer processing of a brain. And we will mix with the machines. We will mix and we will create better brains than that. But we will mix with uh, external brain implants. Uh, computers are doing that already. We will interact with robots. These are the last 15 years of uh, ASIMO. Imagine the next 15 years of ASIMO. And robots will have feelings. And they will be fantastic. Also for women, they will be fantastic. And they will not get tired. <laughs> but robots in the West are bad. In Asia, they are good. They are actually good. We will merge with the machines. In the Olympic Games now, this is one of the athletes from uh, South Africa who has no legs. We will cure all the diseases in the next 20 years, including all these horrible diseases, and eventually we will conquer aging. Aging will die. Death will die in the next 20 years if you don't want to die. If you want to die, that's okay, you can die. But if you don't want to die, you will not have to die. This is called transhumanism, a philosophy about humans transcending our limitations, but carefully, carefully. And so I just want to finish saying that there is always the dark side of the force. We have to be careful. These technologies can be used for bad things. So the world is one. We have to meditate. I do a lot of meditation. And I finish with this Chinese word that means crisis in Chinese. The, this expression has two parts. The first part means danger, but the second part means opportunity. So in every crisis there is danger, but there is opportunity. Muito obrigado.